So I see we've got a number of directors on board, which is good. Um, Vincent's online, which is great. Uh, Office of Emergency Management. Um, I don't see Jesse Potterbaum on here. So I'm, just, I'm gonna briefly touch on the zoo and what they have done and are doing for weather, weather winterization, given the animals that are under their care. Um, the zoo has taken the operational dollars they've had and invested in eight uh, smaller generators. Uh, so now they have a total of 12 generators to run all the life support needs for the animals. Um, they also have propane heaters and short stock tank propane heaters um, and are working towards the procurement of a 550 gallon propane tank to run some things and fill them up themselves. But they've done a, a good job of getting ready uh, for the next whatever winter event is thrown at us. And so I think the zoo is gonna be able to, to keep the animals safe and warm and they are one of the few zoos in Texas that didn't lose an animal during the Snowmageddon. So I think they've got a pretty good track record there. Max, I see you're on the call. Do you want to give a brief overview of what the street department is doing uh, in regards to preparation uh, for this event? Sure, absolutely. So um, as with any, uh, any weather event, we continually monitor and uh, wait for um, feedback on events. Um, our, our winter uh, equipment that we use to uh, ensure that the ice is uh, taken care of and the, the snow is, uh, is taken care of, um, those vehicles have been prepped and are ready to go. Uh, we have put uh, some of our folks due to this event uh, potentially being more extreme than, than a normal freeze. Uh, we have put our people on call um, that they will uh, be ready at a moment's notice uh, to um, uh, come into the come in and uh, get the get the roads clear. Um, and again, we we depend on uh, a lot of feedback from a lot of people, including the PD and the fire department and others that are are um, around town uh, all the time. Um, uh, one other thing for the the solid waste, uh, our solid waste folks. Uh, we will continue operations as long as the roads are safe and the the um the dump is accepting the the trash if uh if the landfill closes uh we will also alter our operations so that we don't uh, have a lot of refuse uh collecting in the trucks and nowhere to to put it um I want to talk. I don't see Rodney on the call, so but Michael Rice is. I want to visit a little bit about water because I know that's going to be everybody's top of mind. Um, we have done a number of different things to get prepared for another winter event. Um, first of which is to help with the freezing conditions in our <coughs> pump houses and uh, wastewater production facilities. We've purchased portable kerosene, forced air heaters, and also electric heaters with generation. Um, so we believe we can be able to keep our chemical pumps and our water pumps in a situation that they're uh, heated and well above freezing conditions, which is gonna be important to maintain uh, the water for the system. Obviously, uh, no one wants a repeat of what, what, ha what happened last February. Um, it is all though dependent upon the electrical grid being sustained. Um, the good news is, despite ERCOT urging people to be cautious, they do say they'll keep the lights on this winter. So uh, this will be a test for them, I think, uh, if they can do that. But we anticipate the power remaining. Uh, we have explored other alternatives to bring in portable generation, uh, but they're in their seven-figure costs, uh, and they are temporary in nature. Uh, we have a long-range proposal we're going to bring to council at the February 11th council retreat. Um, that would allow us to build uh, a microgrid and also some additional uh, standby generation capacity for our water production facilities in five critical locations. That's about a $10.2 million, $10.7 million expense. So it's not cheap, but we'll do it over time uh, as we improve our facilities. The cost of bringing in just some uh, truly portable generation uh, was given the cost too expensive. Uh, we didn't think it, given the risk and given the reality of the situation, the chance of losing power again, we didn't believe that was essential, neither did the council. 
so that's where we are with water. We've gotten uh, heating opportunities to make sure that our, our chemical plants and our water production facilities and our sewer pump stations are will be warmed uh, for a cold weather event like this. And we don't anticipate losing any power at this point in time based on what we're hearing from the state. I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't here necessarily for, for the event last year. Mm -hmm. um, but um, can you kind of talk about what a lot of residents of Babbling, from what I've heard, um, believe that it was the city's fault that they didn't have water or anything like that. But I knew it, I, I know it's, uh, it was the power that you couldn't, that you didn't have. Um, so how, what are you going to, how are you, can you put like residents' minds at ease that something like last year won't happen again this year? So the city of Abilene has a 99.95% uptime uh, over the last 50 years when it comes to water service. And we, like the rest of the state of Texas, suffered uh, catastrophic power loss. And you saw large communities and other cities in the state of Texas face the same challenge we had, which is one of the reasons why the state legislature enacted Senate Bill 3 this last legislative session to help make sure the cities were prepared for winter events in the event ERCOT can't handle its business, which they weren't able to do last February. So I want to be clear, the city of Abilene wasn't able to provide water because ERCOT wasn't able to energize the grid. Now, why that was the case, there's a thousand reasons why we can go through it in a separate meeting if you want to, the majority of which our power plant, mo most of it is that our power plants were not prepared for the cold weather some are offline that are normally online during the summer, which is our peak, but the temperature demand and the heating cycles associated with that freeze caught the whole power system unprepared. And we saw the result of that. Now, the good news is I don't think ERCOT, ERCOT's gone to complete changeover, have complete new leadership uh, and Governor Greg Abbott and the folks in charge of ERCOT have said, we'll, they'll keep the lights on. So I think that's a, that's assurance enough for me. And we're going to, uh, consider that that will be the case. So I know Abilinians were frustrated with that process. I was too. I was out of water. I delivered water pretty much all night to people on my own personal truck just to help where we could, uh, doing things that we could help with. Uh, and many people on the Abilene team did that. Uh, good old Vincent Cantu spent many 24 hours shifts up at the emergency management system so, center. So we were all working hard. Um, to the best that we could. And the good news is I don't anticipate that happening with this freeze. It's just different conditions. Vincent Cantu, Office of Emergency Management. We've been in touch with uh, a lot of our stakeholders uh, throughout the area, uh, making them aware that uh, we do have some winter weather uh, on the way. Uh, we've touched our shelters uh, just to see where they're at, uh, see if they're willing to accept folks. Uh, if, if we do get there, um, you know, that's, that's a big if, but of course we live in a world where we got to plan for these, these types of events. Uh, it's been on a lot of folks' minds, of course, recently as of, uh, last February with, uh, our, our winter freeze. Um, good news is most of our shelters are open. Uh, they've been put on notice. So, uh, there shouldn't be any surprises here. Um, our capacity, we're, we're, we're good to go. So, um, by, by reaching out to our shelters, uh, they, they, they're also making sure that their folks, that they have some folks to call in. Uh, as necessary, and that they have they have the resources that they need. So uh, most of those things that, uh, that, that those elements that make up a shelter, uh, we've already been able to address a, a lot of those. So um, that's the good thing. Uh, we stay in we're staying in touch with our state partners to include TDEM uh, and the National Weather Service. Of course, we're looking uh, Wednesday uh, and, and into Thursday. Thursday looking like it's going to be uh, some of the worst, but we're still we're still looking at a, a timing of this event uh, and severity. Um, as, as we move forward uh, and we stay in contact and, and we get more information about this winter weather event, uh, we'll make sure to plan accordingly. Very good. I want to mention that uh, Stan Lambert's office has already reached out and said, hey, if something happens and you need state assistance, let us know. So uh, the whole state of Texas is watching this carefully, not just those in Abilene. Uh, you know, we're all a little snake bit from last February. So we've got our eyes open uh, and our hands on the controls. I uh, want to talk to Chief Flores um, about the fire department. Chief, why don't you talk about what AFD is doing to make sure we're prepared? So we've uh, been making arrangements for our personnel as far as ensuring that uh, they have uh, food and uh, lasting water to uh, keep them through this conditions if we have the same issues we had last year. 
Uh, we're not in, anticipating that type of event right now, uh, but we do have to plan for the worst, just knowing that last year we were caught off guard and uh, we had to uh, uh, act in a reactive uh, uh, situation. Uh, we do have two fire stations that still do not have uh, generators. So we have purchased portable generators for those stations along with portable uh, heaters uh, and additional supplies to um, maintain operations if the worst should happen and they should lose power. Uh, we've also got all of our vehicles uh, prepped and we're gonna have additional personnel uh, situated uh, throughout the city uh, to handle situations if they start to go sideways. So from a police department standpoint, obviously uh, of, of concern to us are those folks that are unsheltered. And so uh, we are having our homelessness coordinators um, make sure that they are aware of what resources are available so that we can begin directing folks that are without shelter uh, on uh, how best to get themselves uh, into a safe and warm location. Um, obviously one of the, the uh, greatest benefits of these kinds of um, virtual media um, information sessions is that we get to rely as first responders on our media partners to be able to convey to those folks in the public, uh, just as Chief Flores said, to uh, help us out, uh, make sure that you have the needed essentials, food and water, uh, those things that will uh, keep you warm um, in preparation for this storm. And uh, just give us a chance to, um, uh, to have a little bit of time uh, if, we, if, if there is an extended uh, length of time that this thing uh, lingers on, it gives us a little more time before uh, we can provide a response. So uh, you all conveying that information is very, very helpful to us. Uh, and then lastly, in, in closing, I would just say that, uh, you know, we have come a long ways from the storm we had last year. Uh, we had made a request at the police department for some drive vehicles and um, uh, our elected and city management has responded well. And so we have some all wheel drive vehicles that we'll have access to uh, and our city shops will keep us up and running when it comes to chains and um, uh, wraps to be able to, to uh, keep the cars moving if we need to. So, so we're thankful for the position we're in right now. Okay. So uh, airport staff is working uh, this afternoon and has been since this morning on preparations, getting our equipment ready to go. We have plenty of chemical on hand. We were ready for a large event. So uh, we have our meeting with our tenants tomorrow afternoon. We have a little bit I better idea of the uh, how the storm will, will form and the timing of that. So that determines on how we put chemical out. And, what <laughs> we do out. and then uh, at that point, we might even know what American Airlines is going to do as far as cancellation of flights ahead of the storm, which we anticipate that that occurring, but I just don't have any details on that. But otherwise, uh, we're we're preparing, and I think we're in pretty good shape. Good. All right, uh, Julie, do you want to pick up for the library? Sure. We are monitoring conditions as everyone else is, and we're just making sure we have enough ice melt on hand, which we do at all three locations, to make sure if we're open that people can come and go um, without any slipping and sliding. Very good. If we end up having to close facilities down sometimes during this winter weather, if it gets treacherous to travel, we'll shut down certain city facilities. If that happens, we'll send those announcements out through Mari. At this point in time, I'm not anticipating that to take place, but as we close, as we approach the, the event and the weather predictions get a little more accurate, um, we'll be able to probably know more information at that time. So just stay tuned for that. Um, Annette, do you want to talk about the health department? Um, you guys are just now back in your building. So what are you doing to make sure you don't have any more broken sprinkler heads? Uh, yeah, we have a little bit of post-traumatic stress <laughs> disorder. So we've got plans to try to visually monitor the facility throughout the event if it does um, happen. But we're most concerned about our vaccine on hand. And so we've got um, preparations going to get our emergency generators gassed up and ready to go to make sure that we can run those fridges and freezers um, throughout any potential power outage. Those are monitored remotely by vaccine staff. And so they get an, an alert if the power does go out and then a time clock starts on how long those can be out without, or if they have temperature excursions. Um, so we'll monitor that really closely. 
Um, and then we're also working with uh, Vincent and Nate on if we do have to stand up any sort of shelter in, in the event of a power outage and people need to evacuate their homes. So we are identifying medical staff that could potentially be on site as backup for any, um, any need for medical attention. So those are the ways we're preparing. We've got uh, a lot of de-icing going out to the different locations for the rec centers. Uh, our staff have been notified, of course, to be ready to be called in in case we need to bring folks into one of uh, the senior center uh, any of those types of locations, we need to do some quick, uh, you know, warm areas for folks. Um, primarily, we're doing a lot of what everybody else is saying. We're trying to monitor the situation as closely as we can and make sure we're ready to take care of business if anything does happen. So I agree. I think we're all a little bit of, uh, as Annette was saying, we have a little post-traumatic stress from the last time. So we're all very cognitive of what our, our facilities and things are are happening. So we're trying to keep an eye on all that. So that's in a nutshell. I think the city of Abilene is positioning itself well to respond to this winter event. Uh, we do not anticipate the power going off. Um, there's been no indication from ERCOT uh, that you've got something like this happening again that happened last year. Um, ERCOT said just the opposite, in fact, that they're going to keep the lights on. Um, Vincent Cantu with the Office of Emergency Management is in close communication with TDM, Texas Department of Emergency Management. Uh, we are in close contact and discussions with Stan Lambert's office. If that situation changes, we'll be certain to let everybody know and probably send notifications to the press uh, for the general community as well, uh, not just a press conference. But when, at this point in time, we don't anticipate any of that stuff to happen. Um, and we are ready and prepared for a winter event. Any final questions? Yeah. Do, uh, do, Hannah. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead, Travis. Hey. Yeah, um, you know, last year, uh, I think it was February 15th, and, you know, you got pretty emotional talking about your employees. They went through a lot, um, yeah. just like the rest of the city. So you're feeling a lot better this go around. Um, of course, this really can't compare the levels, but at least what we're expecting. But, um, you guys, we learned a lot, and, and we're, we're moving forward, right? That's correct. We did learn a lot, um, and we found some vulnerabilities, which we're continuing to address. It's not going to be something that's solved in and, you know, 12 months, it's something that's going to take uh, money, mainly because of the cost of everything to solve, but we're moving in that direction. The bottom line is I think we're prepared for another event and we're prepared to keep the lights on, prepared to keep the, the water on. Um, and uh, as long as the state and ERCOT keep the lights on, we should be good to go. And I want to ask Vincent about, about self-preparedness. Um, people need to prepare themselves too, right? Absolutely. That's just part of, uh, I think, uh, comprehensive preparedness. I think there are certain things that we can do uh, as, a, as, a, as a city uh, to, to push the message along. I think we've gotten, uh, we've got some resources on the city of Abilene uh, backslash OEM website uh, that with links to uh, ready.gov, FEMA, and, and uh, American Red Cross. So there's some templates there that folks can, uh, they can take advantage of. Uh, to build a plan, uh, uh, make a kit, and just uh, be prepared. You know, uh, it's 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 talking to your neighbors and checking on one another, right? And just uh, uh, making sure everyone's everyone's got the message. Uh, another way to do that is to sign up for Code Red uh, by texting A B I T A Y T X to nine nine four one one. So um, that's a, a great text to enroll feature to uh, keep in touch with exactly everything that we have going on. So. Uh, and, and, and to remember, uh, folks, to, to prepare your homes, um, you know, have those first aid kits available, food, water, um, everything else that we might need in a, a situation uh, like this. It seems like anytime the roads get wet in Abilene, the, the list of, of uh, accidents just gets larger. I wanted to ask, uh, what do you recommend for people to do in the situation coming up? So... We always recommend if you don't have to leave your house during a winter event, don't leave your house, stay home. Um, if you can, you know, there's a number of different tools people have nowadays with, with the internet for grocery delivery and that sort of stuff. You can take advantage of that if you, if you wanted to, but minimizing your trips is important. Prepare ahead of time. Uh, if you're expecting a couple of days of snow and ice, uh, you know, go out and buy things you might need for a couple of days of groceries in your house. Uh, Pre-plan now. Tomorrow is a high of 72 degrees, according to the weather service. So you have plenty of time to go to Walmart or United or, you know, uh, HEB, whatever grocery store you want to go to. You got plenty of plenty of time to do that. Um, and you don't need to make a run on the shelves, just but stock up with things that you think you might need. That's part of what Vincent's talking about. Um, 
And then if you don't have to leave your house, don't. There's really no reason to go out and just run the streets just to see how things are at. You know, it's they're wet and they're cold and they're icy. They've got heavy equipment on the streets, sanding them. So people that do have to use them uh, can use them. But it doesn't mean that they're bulletproof. And, and the, the best course of action anybody can uh, during a winter event with ice and snow on the ground is just stay home if you, unless you have to get out. Max, do you want to add to that? Spot on, sir. Uh, really stay, staying at home. Um, if you do have to get out or for emergency reasons or, or those kind of things, uh, remember that overpasses freeze before uh, roads. And, uh, and our resources are going to be um, focused on uh, the major roads, the arterials and collectors, uh, rather than um, the, the local roads um, may not get as much treatment as the major intersections. Uh, for, for, can you kind of talk about, I know the pipes have been a, are kind of an issue that, and we kind of, like, that have been brought up. Um, is there any worry with those coming up with the cold weather or anything like that, um, like a pipe bursting or anything, any worries like that? I think our water, our water mains are in fine condition. Um, you know, we doesn't mean you're not going to get a burst on a water main, but it's, if you're talking, Joe, if you're talking about personal people's personal pipes, you know, they can, they need to do what they need to do to protect their own plumbing. Um, we had last year during the February freeze, one of the reasons why we had such water issues is everybody was dripping their pipes. Um, and they were doing that because that's what you typically do in Abilene, Texas. Um, so as long as we're able to keep water production up, that's a, that's a solid strategy to help make sure your pipes don't freeze. I wanted to mention real quick that CityLink is not going to close or stop its service until we start seeing roads deteriorate. So CityLink services will continue in operation uh, until we start getting that rent, winter precipitation falling and uh, accumulating on the roads. Um, and then CityLink will, will be able to stand by. Uh, we have some buses that we'll keep in reserve that will have chains on them that will be able to respond at uh, PD and, and uh, emergency management's request to transport uh, those who need shelter uh, in those kind of dire situations. I was going to mention real quick, I believe uh, Tanya with Textile is on, so I wanted to also give her a, a moment if she wanted to take time now to just review what Textile might be doing and um, just to get that information out. Um, but not to put you on the spot, Tanya, if you don't want to. Oh, that's okay. I don't mind. Um, so currently our crews are out in uh, pre-treating the Tier 1 and Tier 2 roadways. Uh, that includes IH-20, US-84, um, between the Roscoe and Garza County line, as well as US 8384 and 277. We'll work on our tier three and four tomorrow. Um, our guys will go to 24 hour shifts. Uh, so crews will be available to respond uh, if need be to retreat uh, or uh, de-ice. I would want to remind the public that um, if our snow plows are out, if we do see accumulation, uh, that our snow plows will be out and to give them plenty of room to work. I, I know that this is kind of a different thing, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. It is very helpful um, to have so many people in the room, essentially, with us and answering questions. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a real help, and I think we all appreciate that. So We're happy to help get the information out, and, and I want to underscore some things. City of Abilene's prepared for this event. Tech Dots prepared for this event. Abilene Regional Airport is prepared for this event. You can go online and look at different resources to see how you best can prepare for this event as a private citizen. Uh, you know, getting some groceries in, in your store in case the roads freeze up is, is a good idea. Um, Office of Emergency Management can put some stuff out here to, to help educate people on that. It's typically on their website already. Um, and if you don't have to get out and the roads freeze, the, ro the roads freeze, so you don't have to get out, please don't. Um, stay home. It helps with the traveling public. Um, if you have to go to work or there's an emergency, obviously uh, do what you have to do to take care of yourself and your family.